Okay, let's get started. Awesome topic today. I'm Greg Cohen. I'll talk a little more about myself in a moment. Is uh, predictable delivery and the power of estimating and forecasting. And part of what uh, this session is about is we as product managers often have to set expectations with stakeholders about when things are going to show up, when we're going to get a product in the market. That might be internal, that might be with customers of ours, and there are times when we have external market events that drive us, that force us to actually hit a deadline. And uh, this session assumes you sort of know the basics of Agile estimating, but if, if you don't, if you're totally new to this, feel free to ask questions, but I'm not going to be defining too many terms. But, but the real problem here is, as product managers, we have at best influence over our engineering teams and what methodologies they use. So we don't really get to dictate that this is how you will, you will do your work to the engineering team. We, we have to work with them to both get to answers that allow us to do our job and also respect the engineer's ownership of their process. And through this, we're going to talk through a bunch of different methods about how you can get to the answers you need based on a variety of ways you might encounter your engineering teams doing estimating and tracking. As far as my background, I've been doing uh, product management now for two decades. I started in medical devices and diagnostics on the East Coast, came out to California during the dot-com. I got involved in the emerging field of software as a service, although I didn't know it was, I hadn't received that acronym or name yet. I was in a precursor of application service providers. I spent most of my career in some element of hosted software space. So after that, I spent uh, about 10 years uh, working with 280 Group and still do work with the 280 Group and recently also formed my own consulting practice, Agile Excellence. I like to write a lot about product management. In 2010, I wrote a, a book, Agile Excellence for Product Managers, which was to help deal with a lot of anxiety in the market at that time with engineering teams switching to Agile and product managers not understanding their role or the tremendous benefit that Agile brings. And this fall, I launched a kind of a course correction to that only in that as the market embraced Agile, we crossed over that chasm and went through this really rapid adoption. I felt that we as product managers sort of have been losing some of the discipline around doing strategy and how we do that in an Agile world, and that we're just taking advantage of the amazing flexibility that Agile teams give us to not sit down and really think through our strategies. So that's my recent book that is out. Let's talk a little bit now on the topic of today, I think, in the next 45 minutes, which is why do we estimate? So I'm going to open that up and see who's got enough coffee in their body. But what are the benefits you see of estimating? Uh, when is it going to be ready and how much is it going to cost? So getting to that timeline and understanding cost. To decide uh, what to build, you can estimate first in order to see, like, if you have some idea about mm -hmm. the value, uh, estimation will bring the cost. All right, okay, yeah, so more of that right, ROI yeah. now, right, a little beyond cost, but am I going to get out of this what I want to get out? Make sure all the components are in place for the supply chain, maybe? Mm -hmm. Say a little more on that. Say a little bit more on that. Well, if you have something that's going to be delivered and you can estimate what the demand is going to be, you're going to need to know what types of things need to be put in place to make sure that they're available. <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're in the market at the time when we need it, so they're not going to the timeline, right? Manage expectations and also manage dependencies, for example, trade show release or something mm -hmm. like that. So in addition to the supply chain, all your marketing push, sales training, everything else around that. Do you the same thing or? 
Yeah, uh, so uh, it's kind of same. So adopt change, quickly adopt the change. So and a good estimation would allow you to do that. And ultimately, you want to succeed. So avoid failures by uh, getting a good estimation about it. Costs and yeah, pull that. Uh, what do you tell the customer? So if you're trying to address the need, how can you forecast when something they need is ready? So it kind of touches on some of the go-to-market stuff that was mentioned. But ultimately, if you're trying to deliver something for a customer, how do you set their expectations? Right. Their expectations, even though the timeline given. So whoever answered that and spoke, can you raise your hand? Yay. I'll give you a free copy of the book. Wow. There you go. Thank you. Let me just pass that one row back. Thank you. Oops. Try not to trip. Thanks. Okay, already I got the pre order. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, after the class, if you want a signature, I will let you know I failed penmanship. And, uh, I was saved by the word processor, an early adopter of that. But I, I will have happy to sign after. <laughs> so thank you for having the courage to answer questions and speak. So some of the benefits, right? So some of the points uh, that were raised here. It lets us plan across the organization, right? We have this estimates this proxy for cost. That came out a lot. How do we get the ROI out of this? Are we gonna meet? How do we scope to meet a deadline that we have to hit? And there's this other one, I don't think we quite touched on it here, um, but actually being able to say you're gonna do something and doing it builds a lot of confidence with your stakeholders. And I get brought into companies because management and leadership has lost some confidence in the team's ability to deliver. Often that's because of pressures management puts on the team that sort of puts them into this chaotic mode. All right, so there's a lot to fix there, but at the end of the, so the point is they've lost confidence that the team can take something and deliver with it and, and bring it over the finish line in a timely fashion. There's also two items, which I call sort of under the line items that aren't as obvious about what we get out of this. The first one is just the act of estimating forces us to ask questions about, well, what is it really that we're talking about? So I'm going to have to estimate it. i got to think a little more deeply. So it starts to uncover assumptions. And we get these clarifying questions come out. And sometimes these product managers can answer those questions. Sometimes we need to go do research. Sometimes engineering needs to go research. But someone has to go off and learn more. And the act of estimating helps us start to uncover those things so we go and get ahead of them. And then the other one, which I rarely, um, really never see anyone talk about, is, is this idea that estimating helps facilitate knowledge diffusion within the dev team. And that can be really valuable so that everyone on the team starts to get up to the same level. Now, there are other ways knowledge diffuses in dev teams. Estimating is one of them. Code review <coughs> can diffuse knowledge. And if you're working with an extreme programming team or a team that's adopted extreme programming, they do pair programming. So that's a great way to diffuse knowledge. So if you have other strong methods for knowledge diffusion, then the idea of estimating, certainly estimating as a large group, not as necessary. But if you don't have good facilities for knowledge diffusion in your team, things like planning poker where everyone sits around and pulls these cards out about what, uh, how, so how, how big they think a certain user story is, can be very valuable in getting that knowledge across the team. Now, there are many popular ways that teams do estimating. Story points and velocity is one. There's t-shirts, usually that works with bigger stories before we, we decompose them. Uh, XP teams particularly get very good at just slicing stories to something about half day, relatively small. So they're not estimating the story, they just get really good at decomposing it and counting how many stories come over the finish line understand what their velocity is, and also more in Kanban world, looking at cycle time and throughput. How long does it take us to get something done once we pick it up, and how many cards are, are coming off the line for, for stories. 
And then the question, I mean, I see a lot of sort of different debates, is who should be doing this estimating? And I see a variety of methods out there. A <coughs> whole team, whoever's interested in a story, should go do the estimating, or sometimes people just rely on their dev lead. What's that, what, what are your teams doing? Who does whole team? Who uses who's ever interested? This was a subject matter. Dev, dev leads. Is anyone working with a team that does no estimating? Okay, everyone's doing some kind. So we see this variety, and, and what you, which one you should use might depend on where your team is, maturity-wise, as well. Some of the trade-offs. If you're bringing the whole team in, you're getting the knowledge diffusion, right? That's a good benefit of it. But it's a big commitment of your team members' time, and it can also be really boring, right? If you're sitting there having to estimate stories, particularly ones you have more specialists that you're not going to work on or don't have an interest in, then it's kind of like this yawner meeting. Right? It's not that interesting. So that's where you might want to do those with an interest in it or just the dev lead. I've seen teams in new projects, brand new teams, it's really good to have the whole team starting. But as you get that knowledge diffusion as the team gets in its rhythm, you might be able to back off to some of these other methods. So it's not that we use a method and then just stick with it the whole time. And then the other question, too, is when should we do estimating? So you can have specific rooming meetings to have it happen in. You can trigger it based on how many cards you have ready. And as that, the, that queue shrinks, can we say we need to get more cards in a state where development can pick them up and work on them? Or we'll trigger that process. Or it can be more ad hoc as well. So now with that sort of as, as set up and understanding of the scope of the way different teams do it, let's talk a little bit about some of the strategies. And on this, and this has been largely my observation working with Agile teams since it was like 2010, the last 18 years or so, or sorry, 2000, 2000 to 2001, is that teams have a signature. And I have found that past performance is actually a very good indicator of future results. Now, that doesn't work if you're in a model, sort of the old IT project management model, where we're always flipping teams around. So it's important to keep the same team. But if you have the same team and you're largely working in the same product area, I find that they, as I said, have a very distinct signature. And you can look at the historical data to understand what that signature looks like. Does that make sense? And then that's sort of the key to being able to get to predictability, to being able to know how much you can bite off and what you can commit safely to customers. And there's different methods we can use. Burn down charts, can little flow diagrams, and we'll, we'll talk about each of these in a moment. T-shirt sizes, putting buffers in, and not random buffers, but informed buffers based on history of your team and understanding what I call ratios of known requirements and stories to emergent. What do we expect to emerge during our development period? So if you look at velocity and burn downs, you know, this is just a typical chart that might come out of JIRA or something. What did the team commit to and what did they achieve? And then you have the burn down. This is an example of <clears throat> wanting to get to market in eight sprints and we have this many story points and we see something goes off, right? And we know early, and that's important too, early indicators that we are not going to hit our metric here. And that's key so that we can adjust. We can extend deadline. We can remove scope. We can inform stakeholders and let them be aware so there's no surprises as we get to the end because it's never going to be 100% accurate. Ray, can you just yes. explain what the burn down is about? Oh, sorry, yeah, the burn down, down is. What's on the x axis and the y axis? So we have sprints, so we're looking at each sprint, how many story points did we accomplish? We have, we started off with, I don't know, 325 story points. And as we move through the sprints, which is the dark blue, we'd like to be on the, the brown line, we see here that we are not hitting sort of the average number of story points we would need to get to release in eight sprints. So we could have um, 
So what could have happened? We could have hit a technical issue here. So we actually did less story points. This might be an example of scope creep. Requirements emerge. So although we were doing a whole bunch of stories, I mean, we, we still have to start adding more in, so we still have a lot more left. Uh, so there are different things that can cause that. You can drill into that. But at the end of the day, the point is we're off the trend line. We're not getting there in eight sprints unless some miracle happens. And we say hope is not a strategy, right? <laughs> so we don't want to rely on that. But we do know early enough to begin to figure out how to correct. Uh, now, this is a cumulative flow diagram. So this you might see more in a Kanban rather than do, doing sprints, doing time boxes, continuous flow. I know it's a little hard to read, so I'm just going to read what you're looking at. On the way left, the dark blue, that's the to-do. The orange is doing. The light blue is cards that have been sent back for fixing or stories. Then you have that thin purple, that's integration test, that on this team was a real QA function group. And then the green bar in there is acceptance test. So that's more of the product manager's business side saying, yep, this story meets our needs. And finally, the maroon is done. Um, this was a project that just scope and requirements just kept getting added and added and added. This is actually a Good example of a very undisciplined team that, that we're looking at here. But the big thing is this. You can look at this and you can basically just extrapolate fairly easily. What is, and you can do this mathematically too, but like, what's our slope? And we got to move everything in dark blue up here to done. How long is that going to take? So you can look at this chart and you can say, if we had no scope, and that ain't going to happen on this team anyway. But even if we just were to add no scope, we got six months more of work before we're getting over the finish line at the rate this team is working. Now you can also look at, sort of you know, actually look at the cards and say how long does it take in time to move horizontally from doing to do to done once it's picked up. How many cards we have in process at any time. That's the vertical between that's sort of the, the sandwich part. And you can do the math and say, yeah, two stories on average come off every week as well to figure out how deep in your backlog, what you'll get to by a certain time. Um, but it's just sort of, yeah, you basically eyeball this and, and you know what you're looking at. And it was very clear early on this team wasn't going to hit a key deadline they were targeting. And they didn't. Blew right through it. Just kept going. So it chose not to contain scope. Uh, T-shirt sizes, so, you know, and, and Agile, the big thing is that we estimate effort. We, we don't estimate time per se, but ultimately at the end of the day as product managers, we usually need to convert back to some sense of time. So I do have time up on this dimension as well. Uh, but T-shirt sizes are an easy way just to look at stories of very different sizes, say how long how big do we think they are? We can convert those into story points if we want as well, but sometimes it's easier just to have the notion of, of, of t-shirt sizes. And when I use them, I sort of, it's, it's a two-way street. So first you say, okay, we have this thing that's big. I haven't done a lot to decompose it. So let's say it looks like a large, it's about a month of work. You can say, does this seem like another similar project we worked on that maybe was also a month? So, we can do that relative sizing too. And then there's a management job in here. Not just, oh, we said it was a month, okay, development, you gotta deliver it in a month. We're in there you know, every day, every couple days with the team, looking at how progress is going. And as the product manager, managing the scope on that side so that we can keep it in the month time box as well, if that's critical. So it, it's a real, um, it's sort of a dance to bring that in within the time frame. When you're, if you're going to be up at that level and not do serious decomposition of it. Then one that I find um, just immensely valuable when I talk about team signatures is buffering for emergent requirements because this lets me do the planning I need to, particularly for, for stakeholders. So it's understanding there's sort of this world we know and then there's these requirements that are going to emerge. And it's understanding where they come from. And 
and what I call NPD, new product development. So that's, for us, that, that's roadmap items. Right? That's the stuff we really want to make progress against. That comes out of new learning, as well as times we have not adequately defined something. So it comes through development, we get it on the other end, and we recognize it's, it's missing stuff. So that's sort of roadmap. Then we have these things that compete for us being able to work on our roadmap. New sales comes in, and we need to respond to something specific to the client. Our existing customers might need something, and we have to respond to that so we can retain and can keep our current customers happy. And production issues and bug fixes, things that we have to address. So that all pulls away from our ability to work on the roadmap. So we need to reserve capacity. If we just assume, you know, if we size with our team our roadmap items and then assume that our teams are only gonna be able to work against that, and we don't consider about where all the other kind of leakages come in the system, and not that I describe these sort of negatively as leakages, but no, this is also important work to be done, but if we don't understand that, there's no way we're gonna hit our commitments right, to our stakeholders and build their confidence uh, and our clients. So we have to reserve for that, we have to plan for that. And this is where it really helps to start looking back at history, and this, you, know, you, you have to label your work so you know where it's going. But just looking that, in this example, right, we had 25 stories that were planned with this team. For every planned story, this is on the roadmap items, three new stories emerged. That was sort of that new learning emergent requirements better definition needed. As I said, I find that teams run fairly steady on those ratios. So you can't compare one team to another, but within a team, like the number of stories that emerge runs very consistently. So that's something really important to track because we know that if we're committing to 25 stories up front, it's really sort of tough. It's at 100 stories that are coming out of that total that we're gonna need to build. And that'll let us know when we can complete that whole bucket of work of those 25 stories. And then we have work that's getting carved off for existing clients and new sales. That one, you know, depending on your business, if you're an enterprise, sales can be super lumpy. So it does change from period to period. But the other great thing about enterprise sales is you usually have very good visibility in the pipeline. You have months to plan and anticipate a customer closing, so you can at least talk through the what if, right? If this customer comes through, how are we going to adjust our commitment on the roadmap item to deal with it, right? You have warning, you have visibility. So if we break down that previous chart, just uh, linearly, we see if we want to do 25 roadmap stories, we're going to need to basically go out seven sprints, that's assuming we do 20 stories a sprint, right? And then we'll be able to handle that and meet our client commits and everything else. So does that make sense? Because this is one of the real key points of, of this talk today is being able to understand where the team is spending its time and therefore when you're planning how much you can really devote to your roadmap work. Do you have any estimates in terms of how much time to buffer for um, customer uh, requests for you know, upgrades or small changes or you know, sales? Is it 20% of the total or, or does it just vary? It varies a lot. But, you know, I think if you're if sort of looking a year out, if you can commit half your team to roadmap work sort of in an enterprise space, you're, you're probably doing pretty good as far as a conservative place. But you know, that's why it varies by team, but you gotta look at what's going on in this team space, the, the 40. But as far as how much, the other one too is we say, okay, when we look at this data, do we agree with it? And if you're doing 80% of your work on client requests, you may need to throttle that back, right? And you say, okay, we're gonna allow 30% of the team's effort to go for the client requests. And this depends sort of where you are, too, in your, your business. Uh, so I can work with a client now, and they just went through a year. They got a few clients, a very early product. Well, they spent a year getting those clients successful. 
That's sort of what you often have to do in enterprise sales early on. And now they're getting back to the roadmap work. But you've got to get those referenceable clients. So it depends where you are. For them, it would not have been okay to throttle back and say we're only going to devote 30% of engineering resources to current clients, given where they were in their, their life cycle. Sir? Just a question, Grant. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of what you're espousing requires a certain amount of discipline and rigor around tracking. Mm -hmm. And what I find uh, across product, product and engineering teams that I'm, I'm involved with or a product owner on is that roles and responsibilities are ambiguous. So you know some of the tools like burn down charts, Jira, Rally, whatever tools you're using. Um, can you kind of speak to what's enough tracking? Because I find that I'm, I might get a program manager or project manager, or I might be kind of product owner or right. doing that myself. So what's enough to kind of be uh, dial into some of the measures that you're... Uh, yeah, no, that's, it's, it's a great question. Yeah. That's the challenge. Right? Yeah. You don't always have a lot of control here. Uh, so you can't necessarily dictate, oh, I want everyone to go to grooming meetings and put story points on stuff. So I think at a minimum, you, you need to know uh, what a given story went towards. Right? Was it this roadmap project? Was it a client? And you need to know when it started and when it came off the line. There, now, you can... Is that, yeah, I was going to say there, there's like a minimal, minimal way that you can do this without having to categorize everything. And that's just the date that it went in to whatever tool you're using. Because any, you can assume that anything after fits in one of these other buckets and anything before a certain date was, was planned work. And so that way, if you don't have the way to go back and tag or you don't even know, then you at least know like this is my original commitment, and then this is the collection of all the other things. So if you can't label which, Whatever, yeah. so you're, you know. You just set the date to. You just set a date and say, this is started, this is the date we knew what we knew, and yeah. then anything else is, is fits in one of these other categories. Very nice of you. Um, so we just sort of finished that out. So, so you know, so, so there are these workarounds. Now, at the minimum, if you can take 10 minutes a week, and you can just count what state the cards are in, you can produce a cumulative flow diagram in Google Docs or Excel. And you can begin to get a sense of that to start uh, making decisions off of. So it's not that time consuming to do it if your team's not willing to do like anything on this side. And hopefully they're willing to do a little bit more. So no, you can have that, you can maybe yeah. have story points, you can triangulate between them to feel a little more confident. I mean, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Like I said, yeah. you mentioned Jira. We've used Rally in the past. Um, it's kind of a mix of uh, Agile and Kanban to a certain extent, just so we can check the status of where things are at. Um, but stakeholders or customers care nothing about <laughs> any of that. Um, you know, they're looking for a need met, and it's just being able to kind of dial in because depending on the, the product and the maturity, to your point, uh, and the project team that you form, you don't always get the same same skill set. <laughs> yep. I just wanted to add a couple of things. I think to Mike's point earlier, right? <clears throat> How much buffering you need to add is also a factor of the maturity of the product itself, right? In terms of what you know, what's coming in, what's going out, and how much the team is aware about the product. And to your point also, I think it comes back to maturity of the team in terms of you know how, how critically they see the value of putting in the amount of effort that's going in. So for you to get a good picture, a good sense of things that are in and out, they have to religiously be putting in that in, maybe it's a Friday activity, right? So it could be a team thing versus just, I think that's kind of, you know, at the end of the day, the tool is a tool, you know, what goes in is what you get out. So I think that both both are a factor of maturity in terms of you know the teams as well as the product. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. I have a question about how do you decide whether an emerging story belongs to the plan systems? I mean, isn't there some decision making where a request comes and you don't and it doesn't even belong to the product or to the product? And that's why it's coming. Is there, how do you make those decisions? Well, so whether you do it or you don't do it. Yeah, so if a request comes in and you don't do it, it doesn't count. The team didn't spend time on it. Mm -hmm. so just a backlog item. But it's not even on your roadmap. Doing. It doesn't make it to your roadmap, actually. I don't know. But who, who decides? Who decides that? 
Ideally, the product owner or product manager, there's one person, uh, but they're not a dictator. Right? They have to get buy-in from their stakeholders, and the stakeholders have to feel confident that you are making the correct decision. So all of those 25, 75, and 40 are consensus decisions? That, I thought so. It works differently in different organizations. Right? I think the 25 is product but. management, and the 75 is probably your engineering team. Yeah, I think the product, product manager or product owner role is to build consensus okay. around the prioritization and the backlog. Now, to keep the team from flailing, right, which is the whole reason why Scrum set up this product owner person was so that you didn't have the end around, right, the VP of sales coming to an engineer and taking them off, something that we thought was getting, another part of the project that we thought was getting done, or the CEO. So it all goes through either the CEO or the, or the PM into the team, but if you're being arbitrary in that role, you're not gonna succeed. Does that make sense? So uh, you mentioned about NPD process, that was quite interesting. And my question is, how do we put estimates into uh, stories that are unknown? Like it will need research and development time ahead of just development. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it could be XXL, but it could be more than that, or it could be, I mean, those are like unknown kind right. of estimates and how that kind of goes into this, this becomes challenging. Yeah, yeah, great question. So, yeah. So two things, if it's XXL already, you, are, you, you know you really need to break that down. <laughs> at least get into some larges, because uh, otherwise you're painting with way too big a brush. I will say, the, the teams that I think, that, that I've seen perform the best, spend a little more time decomposing into small elements. As I said, as product manager, we don't always have influence on that. And it uncovers more questions. Give you one second. And, and just to add to this. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, sometimes strategic initiatives on your roadmap, which is a big box, which may be like 10 hundred right. XXL, <laughs> and somehow you have to figure out before you even go to that small level of detailization by the stories, right? So any recommendations <coughs> on how to approach this like strategic initiative? Yeah, I mean, so then you have to decompose it. And I think the other thing, which we don't cover in this, uh, in, in today's talk, but as you, as those PMs, you have to be really cognizant about lead times. Right, how long do we need to start ahead of time so we can go off and do this research, right, to be able to break it down right. and get to that point where we can at least get to things for maybe larges in the system. But does that answer your question as well? Start early. Well, answer, I won't. Usually you want to do a start <laughs> early on those while not disrupting you know, the, the execution train either, but you've got to carve off some time to be doing that and getting in and doing the research and understanding it. Because the more you break down, the more unknowns you're going to find, and the more questions you need to go out and, and answer. And sometimes there's lead time to get those answers. We don't have them in-house. We have to get access to customers. And if you're in the enterprise space, I spend most of my time, it takes time to get to customers right, and get those answers. Also, just would say this, same principles we're talking about here for development, work for our job of both, in this case, we're talking about grooming, and this is an example of a grooming backlog in Trello, so this is a free tool, anyone should be able to use it. Uh, but just showing, you know, let's move in from backlog to the elaboration phase, that's sort of really where we are doing the research if we need to, moving it to grooming, and then finally to ready. Ready meaning this story has enough definition that the development team can start working against it. And you can also put, you know, bigger discovery also in addition to just grooming onto nice Kanban boards and track it and get a sense how long does it take us to move a card from our backlog through this elaboration and grooming process, right? Because that starts telling us when we have to jump in, managing that lead time effort so that all of a sudden, we, there, there's the two things you want to avoid, right? Which is the ready queue going to zero or the fact that the ready queue goes to zero and I pull stuff out of the backlog and stick it in ready without having really gone through good grooming and elaboration because at that point you're gonna see a real spike in those emergent requirements. That's gonna throw off your measurements. So this helps us in product ownership and product management manage our lead times so that we can always have just enough work to keep the development team fed 
with well-described stories that are well thought through and that, the, uh, that everyone agrees have that has value. So a few just sort of key lessons summarizing here. Past performance is an indicator of future <laughs> results. That's the key assumption here that, that we're depending on, right? We can look at how this team has performed, which is why we gotta keep the team together. If you're messing up, messing up the team, you're not gonna be able to do this. You were referring to the story points and the allocation. Right. Or you have how, how many emerge. You can deliver. Is what? How much throughput. Exactly, throughput. All those things go off. So you can't use past history. You're gonna have to re re-measure in the, if your team changes dramatically. Uh, the process of estimating has benefits beyond the estimate. So those ideas of socializing information and, and improving information transfer and, diff and diffusion throughout the team and figure out how your team achieves that goal. And the real, in my mind, the goal is to have a specialist on a team. And that's an, it's, a, it's hard for PM to really have influence in this area, but ideally you want team members who can pick up any piece of code and work on any user story, even if they're not the most efficient. Now, sometimes there is truly specialist knowledge, so you don't get that. But in general, what happens is someone's the fastest at something. So they always get those stories, and they develop their specialty more, and other people don't get, get developed in the team. And then you have bottlenecks, and you have problems. A person goes on vacation, they get moved to another project and leave and go to another company. It creates all sorts of problems for you to manage. So you're, you're much better with a set of generalists. And even if they might have a specialty area they're best at, that at least there's some comfort that anyone can pick up any part of the project. You do need to track categories of work so you can understand where the team's spending time and what typically you do so that you can work backwards to how much capacity I have for roadmap work. You then, your job is to manage to the team's throughput. That's where we as product managers control scope. And on-time releases requires an ongoing collaboration. In closing, sort of a quote from the author of The Little Prince, which is, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And the idea here is that if there's one area that product owners, product managers control, it's scope. And that's how we can in execute, I guess, outsized influence on the process on hitting deadlines is to really not ask the team to build things that aren't necessary. And that requires like say, research and understanding of the need and the customer context rather than just piling every good idea in there because we're uncertain whether someone might find it. Useful. So uh, just going back to the question about the previous one about um, estimation. Um, sometimes what I've found is a particular story can have like a design work and then development work and the developers are waiting on designers mostly. So even though you bring a story into a sprint, a uh, designer will be working on a sprint ahead. Yes. So the challenges was that, okay, you have to uh, estimate the whole story, but then the designer effort is something else, the developer effort is something else. How, what's the best way to solve that problem at the team level? Oh, so I didn't quite grasp one part of it. So yeah, your, your the designers are working one sprint ahead. Right? They're right. doing the look ahead planning. It's been called sort of dual track. Right. You got your developers working on the current sprint. Right. Okay. So let's say a story is uh, designer estimates that to be like uh, <coughs> twenty points, mm -hmm. and the developer estimates another like forty points. So will that whole story become like sixty points or like can they? Oh, you mean actual design work? Yeah. Yeah, if you're doing it like that, then I'd have two stories. There's a design story and there's a development story, which is, is what I do in that situation. Um, usually, I tend, I found that I manage the design um, pipeline in this nearly the same discipline that I, I like to apply to the dev pipeline. I don't know, do people have other stuff they do in those, that situation? I, I mean, we, we keep that separate. <laughs> you know, design workflow, they actually use different tools, but the same thing, you know. If you're waiting, right. your work's not gonna be done. Um, but we have various teams, like data teams, front end teams, design teams, and 
some of the more workflows. So would you have like separate boards and separate yeah. address or something? Yeah, we, in fact, our design team uses a completely different like workflow system for their, because it's much more inherently yeah. visual versus uh, what our developers are doing. But where the challenge is, of course, where their estimates are off <laughs> and then you're blocked. So. Yeah. Yeah. We have the same thing where the <coughs> we actually have a gate where dev team won't pick up a story unless the designs are part of that uh, story. If the wireframes are not ready, they won't touch it. So that's a check mark before they can move. I think from your last Trello chart from planning, dev won't pick it up. If, that, if it's so dependent on external designs. There's something called the evergreen story, <coughs> which is really good technical work. Uh, just in case you have that issue, right? Design doesn't get their yeah. part of the job done because they're, they're tasked with too many things. There's still really high value work for the development team to focus on. So it's always nice to have a few of those in, in the ready state. In which case, the lead, <laughs> the tech, the tech lead will basically do the design or yeah, you as the PO can provide the design the rough team. design for that. We've got about one minute. Yeah, so. um, that Trello board. Mm -hmm. um, that you just shared, um, it's great. I love the idea that we can get the grooming and that's when we can have our estimates. Oftentimes we're, we're asked to estimate when the stories are a little bit further left on that, <laughs> that board um, and we're living deep in the cone of uncertainty. Right. Any, any you know, advice at that, you know, the needing to plan so far ahead where mm -hmm. there's still you know, that uncertainty. I mean, yeah. you, know, you gave the, the buffer ratio mm -hmm. based on what passed. Right. Um, is it really that, or are there any other you know, guidances for that early? Yeah, so I think it's two things. Look, mm -hmm. uh, look at that buffer ratio, yeah. or you know, if you're let's say, doing the t-shirt sizes and you say it's a large, and in your mind you're trying to equate larges to a month or another, before you even equate it maybe to a time frame, see how long it took you to do a large in the past. But so, I mean, at the end of the day, they're estimates, right? Mm -hmm. If we were right, we would call them facts. Okay, so we have to understand, yeah, you know, for plus or minus 20%, we're probably doing good. But it absolutely, you know, at least for me, it's never made me uncomfortable to take a swag at something. Yeah. Right, and just say, you know, we know this is big. We know this is small. And sometimes you get surprised. But if you got the right people in the room, you can at least uncover the key issues. I, I find teams usually actually do a pretty good job mm -hmm. at it and can work through whatever challenge they might hit in the project. But yeah, I think the only one you gotta watch out for is if you're attempting something that you know could be just technically impossible. Mm -hmm. right? If you're trying to prove a new technology and it could just fail. Yep. You know, like, can I supply big data and come out with an algorithm that's gonna truly predict who's gonna, uh, I don't know, show up in the emergency room? Right? That's the one you just don't know. Okay, well we are at time, so I want to